When we're talking about curves and distributions, we can't talk about those without talking about the normal distribution. This is the natural starting point whenever we're going to talk about any kind of curves and distributions. So the normal distribution, one of the most common shapes in statistics. It just happens so naturally, so beautifully, um, and that's what it looks like. It's that nice bell curve, um, and um, you know, it's 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 mesocurtic in the sense that it's not leptocurtic being too peaked or platocurtic being too flat. It's not skewed positively or negatively, so there's no skew, um, and it's just that nice, beautiful bell curve that just happens so naturally uh, all the time. And in fact, when we're talking about things like sampling distributions and um, any time where you're gathering enough data, it's like at some point you're going to get the normal distribution it's, it, just because it's just it's so natural um, that it just happens so often that so many statistics are based on the assumption that you have a normal distribution in your data. So looking at any distribution, um, but we'll sort of use a normal, the normal distribution as our guide, every distribution has at least three parts to it. So it has the peak, which is the highest point in the curve. It has the tails, which are both ends of that curve. And it has the baseline. And so that's literally just that horizontal line where um, when the, when the, the, uh, curve hits that line, theoretically, um, then that means there's zero cases at that point. So if we were to say go out here, um, then if we went out far enough, eventually it would become close enough to the baseline that we would say there are zero cases there. So the farther up it is, so like the peak is showing the highest number of cases, the tails are showing the lowest number of cases. So when you're looking at a normal distribution, there are two important properties. There's the fact that it is symmetrical. So this is, again, goes back to the fact that it is not skewed in either direction. Uh, and so that means if you put a line right down the middle, it's exactly the same on both sides. Both sides are identical. It's a mirror image um, on either side of that um, middle line. Uh, and also that middle line, if it's, a if it's a normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode would all be the same value. Just keep that in mind. Um, so another important property of the normal distribution is that it is asymptotic, which is kind of what I was alluding to when I was talking about the zero cases, that um, if it gets close enough, we can sort of assume zero cases. But really, in a normal distribution, the tails never actually touch the baseline. Because normal distribution is all about probability and how probability is the highest right where the peak is. So whatever the value is where the peak is, um, that's the highest likelihood value for whatever the variable is. But um, as you go out farther from the from that peak into the tails, it gets closer and closer and closer to that baseline, but it never actually touches. And that's because there is always a chance that 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 those values way far out could happen. It's just like really, 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 really small chances, like minusculely small chances that are we can essentially say they're basically zero, but they're never actually actually zero. So that normal distribution never actually touches the baseline. So then how does this relate to scores or values on a variable? <clears throat> so the peak is the highest probability of that score of a score occurring. So whatever score the peak is at, that score has the highest probability of happening. So let's take an um, easy example that I'll probably use a couple of times. Um, but if we look at IQ, so IQ, when we look, it's a nice, beautiful, normal distribution. The mean IQ is 100, so that means the peak is going to be right at an IQ of 100. And then the standard deviation is 15, so that means that it's going to be, um, our standard deviations are going to go out in sort of chunks of 15, but we'll talk about that later. But essentially that peak means that that IQ of 100 is the highest likelihood. So if we took any sample, any random sample of people, um, then there it's the highest likelihood that the most people are going to get 100 or right around 100. So that's the peak is the highest likelihood score. Then the tails, of course, you have a low probability of those scores occurring. So when we get further out into the tails, so for like IQ, it'll be like out into like the, 
you know, 145, 160 up at the top, 175, like way super high or, you know, super low down to like, you know, 45 and 30 and 15 and getting close to almost zero. Those are very, very low chances, um, low likelihoods of occurring. So not impossible, but very, very low, low likelihoods. <clears throat> and so then when you're between the tails and the peak, as you come from the tails, Kind of up to that nice peak, the, the closer you get to the peak, the higher the probability that that score is going to happen. So 100 is the highest for IQ, but you know, like 102 is also pretty high and 98 is also pretty high likelihood. But then the farther you get out, the lower the likelihood until you're way in those tails with really low likelihoods. <clears throat> so now let's bring in standard deviations. So we're just going to use, uh, and, and often the, uh, the, the nomenclature of S is just used um, just to uh, designate the standard deviation. So S means standard deviation, and it's always at the same point on the curve. So again, this is assuming you have a normal distribution, which most cases you do. But um, if you have a normal distribution, then you're going to see essentially the same um, number of cases that are falling within a certain di distance from the peak. So looking at this, um, we can see that, so there's our right in the middle, and it's a zero because it's zero standard deviations away from the mean. That's what these zeros and positive and negative one and two and three mean. So these numbers are standard deviation. So minus three then means, so we're way out here in the tails, and we're three standard deviations below the mean. Or if we're at two, that means we're two standard deviations above the mean. That's what that means. And so this is the mean, so it's going to be zero because you are at the mean. And we can see that we have half of our sample on one side of the, of the peak, of the mean, and half is going to be on the other side. That's what the 0.5 designates. So looking at now what's called the area under the curve. The area under the curve is literally if we say, so if we're going to the one standard deviation area under the curve, that means we are going up to the one standard deviation above the mean and down to one standard deviation below the mean and taking all of this literally area under the curve. So we shade in all this, this sort of distance between minus one to plus one standard deviations and we kind of take all the cases that fall in here. And this area under the curve, that's a pretty important term. This is used a lot anytime you're using um, sort of predictability analyses and things like that. And, um, and sort of there are a lot of statistics that use this area under the curve. So just know that that's a specific term. So we're looking at this area under the curve. So if we go between one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation, this is going to be about 68% of all the cases. If you have a normal distribution, that number does not change. You will always have about 68% of cases falling under that the curve between one and minus one. And I say about 68 because the actual value is 68.26, but just think of it as exactly 68% or sorry, about 68% and the exact number you don't have to worry about. But that number doesn't change. That number is always the same because if you have a truly normal distribution, that number is, doesn't change. Similarly, we go to the 2s area under the curve. So now we're going up to two standard deviations and down to minus two standard deviations away from the mean. So we are now incorporating this much area under the curve. And so this is going to contain about 95% of all of our cases. And again, that number doesn't change. Now the actual value is like 95.44, but again, you can just think of that as about 95%. And we go out to the three standard deviations, and I'm not gonna show you another picture, you can just sort of imagine it's basically filling this entire thing, even though remember, the normal curve is asymptotic, so it never actually touches the baseline, but it's essentially going out there, which is why when we go up three standard deviations, it goes actually to 99% of all cases, about 99. It's actually much higher th than that in the sense that it would actually round up to 100 because it's actually 99.74% of cases would fall between minus three standard deviations and plus three standard deviations above, the, above and below the mean. But we don't want to round up to 100 because we don't want to say 100% of cases because it's never 100% of cases because the normal curve is asymptotic. So that's why we say it's about 99%. But remember that that's actually 99.74%. Um, however, 
Something that also is important is if you ever see a confidence interval equation, um, which is, you know, saying that, you know, the confidence interval is you'll have your mean, you know, plus or minus whatever. And so if it's like, um, you know, the average age of this, this population was, you know, 21 plus or minus two and a half years. That's a, that's a confidence interval. And actually, um, it's a confidence interval equation gives a 95% confidence, meaning that you're 95% sure that the real value is somewhere within that confidence interval around the mean that you got from your sample. Again, remember we're talking about kind of, you can go back to the thinking about the inferential statistics stuff, um, which if you haven't seen those videos, go back and watch those because that's pretty important. But um, if you're, if you have your sample statistic, you're trying to then say the likelihood that what you got in your sample is representative of the, of the larger population that you actually want to talk about. So a confidence interval says, well, we're 95% sure that the actual population value lies somewhere in this range, and our sample statistic is right in the middle of that. And a confidence interval equation uses the value 1.96s, which is 1.96 standard deviations, because that gives you the equivalent of exactly 95%. So when you're saying a 95% confidence interval, it's a pretty important number to say 1.96 because that's what gets you 95% because this two snare deviations is actually a little bit more than 95%. So that's just kind of an interesting tidbit if you ever see anything about a confidence interval and it's um, a 95%, then you can know that they use the 1.96 standard deviations because that gives you the exactly 95%. So how do we put these standard deviation proportions to actual use? Here's an example. So what percent of cases would score more extreme than plus or minus two, two standard deviations? Think about that for a second before I tell you what it is. So we're talking about if we go to that two standard deviations above and below. So more extreme means both sides of that curve. So everything outside of the two standard deviations at the top and the bottom. So think about it for a second. It's 5% because we know 95% are within two standard deviations, either above or below. So think about that area under the curve. We had 95% under there. So when we take into account both tails that are more extreme than that, that's going to be the remaining 5%. Now, if you think about what percent of cases score higher, then two standard deviations, again, think about it for a second. We're now talking about only the one side. So what do you do? You cut that 5% in half because we're talking about only the top half of that. Um, we're looking at our curve. And so we've got the 95% and what's left is 5% on both sides. So you divide that by two. So you're only using the upper half percent. And then what percent of cases score at the minus three standard deviation point or lower? Again, think about it for a second. Now, if we had, if we're only using the 99%, then basically you have 1% left and it would be a half a percent, right? Well, let's use the actual 3S percent this time, which is that 99.74, just to sort of see. This actually, so we have 99.74% that are within our area under the curve on both sides. So the remaining um, is going to be that like 13 or sorry, 16%. Is that right? No, 26%. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the 26%, uh, well, like 0.26%, but then that's both sides. So you want to divide that by two. So that gives you your 0.13%. So think about that. If, if somebody is scoring higher than three standard deviations above the mean, that means that there is a 0.13% chance that that's going to happen. So that's like a tenth of a percent. So that's pretty rare. So it's very, very difficult or, or unlikely for somebody to score higher on, so looking at something like IQ, higher than three standard deviations above the mean, which if we, if our mean is 100 and our standard deviation is 15, then one standard deviation above the mean is 115, two standard deviations above the mean is 130, three standard deviations above the mean is 145. So if somebody is scoring higher than 145 on the IQ test, there is a 0.13% chance that that's going to happen, which means about 0.13% of the population scores that high, that higher than that 145. So it's very, very rare, um, and it's sort of an interesting way to think about it.